So the thing is that I will use my mobile, that I am not tweeting, I'm not using Facebook, I'm using my mobile for something really important to me at this moment. And I think well, that's one of the first lessons that I learned from Nico Mele, which is that the way we use, it's, it's not that easy to figure out the way we are using technology and the way people are using technology. And it can be mislead us. So the first time I heard Professor Nico Mele speak, I was at the Neiman Foundation. It was last year, and I was so proud of having been chosen as a Neiman. And I was starting to think that maybe we should be more optimistic about the future of journalism and journalism in general. But then, Nico spoke. And he hit me with his views about how hard it is and it will be to retain the public conversation that we call journalism and for today and in the next decades. And I felt challenged. And I have to admit it, I felt a little bit upset because I was living my dream year and he was telling me that the storm was coming. I didn't want to listen to that. But after taking his class and after different conversations with Nico Mele in Cambridge, in London for unknown reasons, and in Santiago de Chile, where he went, I realized that that's what Professor Mele is best at, challenging us, forcing us to realize that if we want to be relevant for our readers or our audience, we have to start to prepare today, right now, for that present and for that future. Nico Mele is an adjunct lecturer in public policy and a leading expert in the integration of social media and everything digital with politics and business and communications. And he's also the author of The End of Big, which is a book about how some of our big institutions, journalism included, are mutating into a smaller, uh, more flexible spaces, sometimes for better and sometimes for worse. It's a book, it's a book about being big and small about being feeble and powerful. And I think The End of Big is a proper name for a book written by someone like Nico Mele, who knows how to make you feel humble about everything you don't know, but so big and powerful about all the things you can still learn. My professor, Nico Mele. Thank you. Like Ethan, I find this a bit of a terrifying arrangement, <laughs> in part because I'm following some exceptional people who have been real inspirations to me in my life. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's just a, it's a little terrifying. Although I was thrilled to learn I am not the most tattooed Harvard professor, which <laughs> for a long time I thought might be true. I think the world changed in 1984. The good nerds among you will remember that was when Steve Jobs introduced the first Macintosh personal computer. But that's not what I'm talking about. In 1984, a guy named Chuck Hull invented something called stereolithography. Today we call that 3D printing. That's a 3D printer. It sprays plastic into shapes. I have one, I bought one about a year ago. Yesterday I took a group of recent Neiman Fellows who I had lunch with to my office to see it. I have two little boys, almost five and almost three, and on the first warm spring day last April, I wanted them to wear uh, sandals outside. But they'd grown a lot since the last summer, and I didn't really want to put them in the car to take them to, mall, to the mall to buy new shoes. So I printed them sandals. And a couple weekends ago, we were at a friend's house, and she had these new shoes, heels she'd bought, and my wife says, oh, I love those. And so I said, oh, could I borrow them overnight? And I took them. I took them and I scanned them with a 3D scanner and then I printed a copy. Although my wife was not too keen on wearing them in yellow plastic. <laughs> and this sounds awesome. This is what I love about technology. All of the opportunities this opens up. 
There's an engineer in Italy who's built a 3D printer that prints large, uh, that is almost buildings that they're trying to figure out if they can use to print latrines. There's all kinds of opportunity being opened up by this. But a couple days after I printed the sandals for my boys, a guy in Texas uh, uploaded the blueprints to print the essential pieces of an AR-15 assault rifle and then printed them and shot them on camera for some journalists to prove that this would work. And this is the essential promise and peril of our technology. Jill opened with that ad, right? The, 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 the right of unlimited. And that sounds like a joke, but I believe that's actually at the heart of our technology. That's an essential value our technology carries. It's the technology to make the individual powerful beyond, beyond comprehension. And the thesis of my book, my argument, is that our technology is pushing power to individuals at an enormous, intense rate, an incredible diffusion of power that all of our big institutions are not really prepared to manage. Big news, big political parties, big, oh, big government, big militaries, even big fun, movies, music, publishing, big companies, big manufacturing, the commoditization of scale. It's not any good to be big anymore because someone smaller will compete, has the power in almost any industry, in almost any institution. I go to meetings all the time in Washington, D.C., and, 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 and in corporate board rooms, and even, I dare say, the occasional Harvard faculty meeting. And I, I sit in these meetings, and I think, this is not a world I know. You, you people making these decisions, I don't live in the same world as you. I come out of computer programming. All of my significant mentors were either computer programmers or political operatives. And I just don't recognize some of it. And uh, I was reading uh, Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August. And she's talking about King Edward VII's funeral in 1910. And how in 1910, it is the most opulent thing imaginable. You would look at it and think the monarchy was going to live forever. A hundred nations send their representatives, all of them colonies or monarchies, except for the United States, Switzerland, and France in 1910. And then I read King, Kaiser, and Tsar about the letters they were writing, the cousins were writing back and forth to each other. And they're writing, they're writing in, in 1910, they're saying, in 2013, when our grandchildren are the monarchs of Europe and the colonies. You know, it's 1910, and like Lenin is on the streets shouting, right? And that's basically how I feel all the time. <laughs> and where we ended up, this was not an accident. The power, the unlimited power for the individual, that was not an accident. Does anyone want to guess? the year of the first computer science program in the United States? 1962. Anyone want to guess where? Purdue University, 1962. That means that if you're a computer scientist growing up in the 60s, you're growing up on college campuses in the middle of the civil rights movement and the, uh, the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. Here you are building computers for the Pentagon to use, right? And a generation of computer scientists rejected that. They, they, they didn't want that. And so they designed technology to push power to individuals. This is a Cray supercomputer circa 1975. In 1975, it cost five million bucks, base price, and was only available to the world's largest institutions, big governments, big universities, big corporations. 
And today, your smartphone is actually a lot more powerful than this Cray supercomputer. And you can walk into any strip mall in America and buy one of these. And I, I just read Turing's Cathedral about the relationship between the development of the uh, nuclear bomb and the development of the computer. And I thought, wow, imagine if you could walk into any strip mall in America and buy a nuclear bomb. And that's kind of how I think of this. And so here are all these computer scientists growing up on college campuses in the 60s. And uh, you know, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, they met just days after the Kent State shooting. This is the cultural environment they're growing up in. And there's this guy, Ted Nelson, writes this book in 1974. You can and must understand computers now. Computer lib. And this book says we must claim computers away from the institutions and push them to people because it's the only way we will hold that power accountable. Bill Gates, with his first gazillion dollars, bites, buys the rights to this book and republishes it in 1984. If you've read Walter Isaacson's biography, Steve Jobs talks about the, the, the power and the influence of thinkers like this. This was the culture that the nerds came out of. The 1984 television ad that introduced the Macintosh during the Super Bowl was one about, you know, sticking it to the man. And so then we have this incredible pace of our technology. In, from the mid 70s to the mid 80s, we go from computers that fill a room to sitting on every desktop in America. Then we start connecting them to each other to share the proverbial H drive and the printer. And then we start connecting them all to everybody else. And now we have the internet. And now we walk around with these things, right? And that is, that's tremendous power for individuals that disrupts our institutions. Our institutions built on hierarchy and process. So this guy, Sebastian Thrun. Sebastian Thrun, tenured professor at Stanford, very prominent, leaves Stanford to teach online through Udacity, saying, I'd rather teach 150,000 students than 150. And I thought, and he doesn't have to go to faculty meetings. <laughs> Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech now offers a $7,000 engineering master's degree available only online. Now, I think that part of the story here is not just about the push of power from institutions to individuals. It's also about the way our institutions have failed. The cost of a four-year degree in the United States has skyrocketed. Its economic value has plummeted. The Department of Labor says that 19% of parking attendants have finished a four-year degree and have all the corresponding debt. In many ways, higher education has fundamentally failed in the United States. And yet, it's an important vehicle for basic research, for credentialing, for peer review, for scientific process, for all kinds of essential stuff. And so I struggle because I don't really want to defend the institution of higher education, but I also feel like it has these core essential values that are fundamental to who we are and to being a, a healthy democracy. Then we talk about politics, right? I think that the story of Obama beating Hillary in 08, an unthinkable political act for an insurgent to beat an establishment politician like Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton has spent her entire life in the Democratic Party for running for president. Obama had been in public life less than 10 years. Hillary knew the name of every major donor in the Democratic Party, which was, in fact, part of the problem. And Obama was new. And yet Obama manages to defeat Hillary because the power existed outside the party. The parties had failed. They'd become vehicles for major donor fundraising. And if you could build an alternative way of raising money through the internet, you could defeat it. Unless you think that that was just a Democratic story, that's what's happened in the Republican Party. Part of why we're in our current predicament, a guy like Ted Cruz does not need the establishment Republican Party. The, the institution has failed, and the breakdown of accountability is intense. We had 12 Senate races the last two cycles with a Republican establishment candidate lost to the Tea Party insurgent. 
And now we talk about journalism, right? The institutions of journalism, they don't seem to be able or ready to account for the individual power. I think it changes the production of news. And I think, again, of recent Neiman fellow, Laura Amico and Chris Amico, and their uh, Homicide Watch DC about trying to empower the community to help produce the news, the changing the way we produce the news, changing the way we distribute the news. I, I did this for the current Neiman class the other day, right? I think about some of the big moments in American history, the shooting of JFK. Everybody remembers Walter Cronkite taking off his glasses, crying. We think about, I say Watergate, everybody in this room thinks about the Washington Post. I say uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and you have these images from CNN, right, of the wall coming down. I say 9-11, and I always think of Rudy Giuliani doing press conferences to communicate what's going on. The death of Osama bin Laden, Keith Urban up here, he tweets, I have just heard from a reliable source, they've killed Osama bin Laden, hot damn. He didn't have that many Twitter followers, but he was a senior member of Donald Rumfeld's staff uh, when Donald Rumsfeld was Secretary of Defense. And down here is a reporter for the New York Times, Brian Stelter, who retweets it, and it goes viral. The distribution of that news was all from individuals on Twitter and Facebook. And in fact, the first time the, first, the person really, the journalist to break that news was a New York Times reporter, and national security was not his beat, and he wasn't in Washington, D.C., and it was via Twitter. And then finally, we talk about business models, right, for journalism. Here is Nate Silver, and I'm sure some people will argue with me whether or not he's actually a journalist, right? He's driving 20% of the New York Times traffic to their website right before the election the day before the election. But he has to choose, because he has a brand new book out, and he has to choose every day, does he sell his book, or does he help the New York Times get more people to visit their website? A kind of lunatic institutional organization where the talent is not aligned to help the institution make money. And so, Broadly speaking, when I think about, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a computer programmer and a political hack, a political operative, and the uh, journalism was not something I was too fond of in either role. And the great lesson to me of the Neiman Fellows has been the essential nature of the core values of journalism in our society. But when I look at many of the institutions that carry those core values for journalism, I'm, I'm not inclined to defend them. Business models built on 80% advertising make absolutely zero sense to me from my nerd vantage point. And so my hope and prayer, my excitement for talking to all of the Neiman Fellows comes down to building the future of journalism, building new institutions, new vehicles to carry these core values of journalism that take advantage of the digital world, that take advantage of the enormous power that individuals carry, and assume that there will, I assume there will be no more big. Except, asterisk, there are seven companies that essentially control your online life, Amazon, Apple, eBay, Facebook, Google, Skype, and Twitter. And just like newspapers needed to learn over 50 to 75 years, like the core values of sourcing and their sense of public responsibility. I too think that these, these big institutions, these big, the new big, they have to learn their own role in mediating the public space. And we need to demand accountability from them. I was sitting in my office directly across the hall the day of the Boston bombing. And I had to get evacuated from my office because there was a bomb threat in Harvard Square, and it turns out there wasn't a bomb threat. It was a rumor on Twitter. And it is absolutely incomprehensible to me why Twitter did not say, here are three feeds you should follow for accurate news about the Boston bombing. The, Bo the Boston Police Twitter feed, the FBI Twitter feed, and maybe, I dare say, the Boston Globe Twitter feed, right? <laughs> 
There are opportunities here that we must take advantage of. And I am delighted to speak to all of you and yield the balance of my time to whoever's next. <laughs>